All right. Hey, good morning, Lorenzo. How are y'all today? Awesome. All right. Um, I don't have any um, real announcements to make. Um, we're going to be going, oh, I'm going to be addressing any of your questions over assignment. 17. If you have any lingering questions over assignment 16, that's fine too. Um, as a reminder, uh, this week um, you're going to be submitting assignment 17, 18, and 19 notes and homework. No, sorry, 16, 17, 18 notes and homework. Uh, 16, 17, 18 notes and homework. Um, again, if you um, I know, I think it was y'all, you already have submitted assignment 16 with last week's. Please resubmit it with this week's material, um, just because that's what I'm going to be grading this week. Uh, we will have a quiz to, uh, on Friday. Uh, that quiz will be over material from assignment 16 and assignment 17, uh, what we're talking about today. On Friday, we will be talking about assignment 18 uh, material. Uh, make sure that you watch those lecture videos for assignment 18 before Friday, and uh, hopefully, can get started working on the homework. Um, the I'm going to apologize right now. The assignment videos for assignment 18, or the lecture videos for assignment 18, um, I I felt like. I made those really recently, and I felt like I made a lot of mistakes. I corrected them in the video, uh, but so I'm just going to apologize for <laughs> any mistakes that I make. Um, they get corrected, but um, it's not like I just cut that part of the video out. I just kept on talking and said, oh, this is a mistake, and I went back up here and changed it. So I apologize for any errors uh, that I make as we work our way through the lecture for um, assignment 18. I need to not make videos at, after 10 o'clock at night. Um, that's, that's my problem. So that's all I really had to say as far as notes or announcements. Um, let's talk about how I can address your questions over assignment 17. Um, can we go over number four? Problem number four. Time at 17? Yes. Okay. All right, so I, uh, I'm going to have to be using my... Uh, notebook paper today um, I started updating my iPad and it's taken longer than I thought so assignment 17 uh, problem number four alright so we have a graph that looks something like this Um, I'm going to mark some points of interest here. Uh, looks at negative 5, and then at positive 5. Um, all right, we're just going to do our best to do this.
Uh, let's put some other points of interest here. All right, well, we'll mark those points of interest as we approach the problem. All right. So, A. Is it a function? Yes or no? Why? It, yeah, it passes the vertical line test. Vertical line test. All right. B. What is the domain and what is the range? In your own words, what does it mean to be domain? What is the domain talking about? Um, the x values on the, the graph values. or function? On the, F, the x values uh, of that you are represented on the graph. Now, does this graph keep going? Yes. Yeah, if I kept on going out on the graph, this graph, I mean function would just keep going up and up and up. If I kept going this way, the graph would just keep going down and down. All right, so what's my domain? What x values are on the graph? Um, parenthesis, negative infinity, and infinity. And what about my range? The same thing? Same thing. So, because of the arrow notation on this graph, we know that the graph indefinitely goes up in this kind of upward tra trajectory, continues to get further and further away from the y-axis. Same thing can be said down here. So, you can plug in x's all the way up to infinity and get some output. So, because you, for every single x, even out here to infinity, you get some output out for y. That's going up, and down here it's going down. That's why our range is negative infinity to infinity. Okay. Um, I want to skip to, I want to skip around a little bit. I want to get to problem number f. Uh, mainly because problem number F is a little bit easier to deal with, the x-intercepts. Where is this graph crossing the x-axis? So um, you, you have your homework there with you. Um, I should probably add a little bit of information here. Let's see. Then one, two... Okay. So, as you read the graph from left to right, there's this first x intercept over here. Where is that x intercept at? What is that x value? The first one over here on the left. Negative 6. So we have negative 6, 0, then what? Negative 4? Well, if you look at the graph, if you look at the oh, graph, it's, you have it's negative, negative 3. Five. What? Negative 3. Negative 3. And then what? Don't forget uh, the, it, the origin. Origin, which is at 0, 0. Then what? Uh, 3. Yeah, I'd say three zero. Then what? Six. Six. All right. I mean, you have to look at you have to actually look at the graph that as it's presented to you in the notes to to see that. Um. Let's skip around a little bit. Is it odd or even? Let me put it this way. 
is this graph symmetrical? If it's even, that means it's symmetrical about the y-axis. So that means the left-hand side is a mirror image of the right-hand side. Is the left-hand side an exact mirror image of the right-hand side? Is it odd? I'm asking, I'm asking, is it even? Is the left-hand side an exact mirror image of the right-hand side? Yes. It is? Well, no, 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 no. No, the left-hand side is not an exact mirror image of the right-hand side because, look, you have it below the x-axis here and then above the x-axis over here. So it's not even. Now, my graph doesn't do this very good justice, but if you look at the graph and the present presented in the homework, it has this very nice cement behavior. And if you look real closely at your graph, here to here, you have that symmetry about the origin. If you were to uh, take this graph, part of this, this part of the graph, and flip it over the y-axis, you would get this. And then if you flip that about the x-axis, you would get this part of the function. You all see that? And if you were to flip this part about the y-axis, you would get this. And then flip that about the origin, you get this part up here. So you're exactly right, Alex. This is symmetrical about the origin, so that makes it odd. All right, let's go back to some of the more harder questions. Uh, because this graph doesn't give you all the exact x and y values. You kind of have to estimate um, so I'm specifically talking about part uh, C, where this is asking things like where is the function increasing and where is the function decreasing. So the function is increasing, we'll use red, all right. The graph is going up. Now, the graph is going up all the way back here at negative infinity, and it keeps going up until you reach what x value? What's the x value that's associated with this maximum right here? Uh, it looks like about 5. 5. I would say that's a pretty good guess, pretty good estimation. So from negative infinity to 5, the graph is going up. Then what starts happening? Let's talk about decreasing. Then the graph starts going down, right? Now, again, you kind of have to estimate this. If I look at that graph, I'm going to estimate it. You know, it looks like it's going down until you get this x value right here. It looks like it's right between negative 1 and negative 2. So what's between negative 1 and negative 2? Negative 1 half? Negative 1.5. Negative 1 half would be, between, would be between 0 and negative 1, right? Yes? Nod your head up and yes. down. Yes? All right. So it's decreasing from, and that should be a negative 5 right here. It's decreasing from negative 5 to a negative 1.5. And then what starts happening, the graph starts going up again. Now, if it's symmetric about the origin, if it's symmetric about the origin, since we had this little minimum point right here at negative 1.5, then we should have a little maximum point right here at 1.5. So it would be increasing from a negative 1.5 to a positive 1.5.
and then it starts going down again. And you'll notice if it's symmetric about the origin, it's go, it was going down from negative 5 to a negative 1.5, so it's going to be going down from a 1.5 to a 5. And then it's going back up And that's going to be going up union from a 5 to infinity. Does that make sense? How we came up with that? All right. D asked the questions, where are the uh, max and min? Max and min. Uh, ma I'm glad I said it like that. Maxima or maximas. It could be more than one or minimas. So you're looking for um, places where the graph is transitioning from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. So looking at our graph, this point right here would be called a, a maxima, right? right up here. What are the coordinates of that maxima? What would you say the y value is? A negative 2? A negative? A positive 2. A positive 2. My bad. No, positive no. 2. So the maxima would be at negative 5, positive 2. Is there another maxima? Sure, right over here. What is that coordinate? 1.51. 1. Good. All right. What about minimas? Minimas are where the graph transitions from decreasing to increasing. So think about this. If it's symmetric about the origin, basically this point should be the opposite of this point. So this should be at a negative 1.5 comma negative 1. And then again this is a min and if it's symmetric about the origin this point should be the opposite of this point. So what's the opposite of this max? What's the opposite of negative 5, 2? The opposite would be 5 negative 2. Alright. Does that answer your questions about problem number 4? Okay. What else can we look at? Number 10. Number what? 10? Yes. Problem number 10. We want to solve x minus 1 over an x minus 2 is less than 0. So you could do this by graphing this function. We could graph this function, graph the horizontal asymptotes, the vertical asymptotes, the x-intercepts, the y-intercepts, and we could draw a line at 0 or the x-axis and see where the graph is below 0. The purpose of this problem set is not to go through that process, but just to analyze the function and come up with the x-intercepts and vertical asymptotes and do some testing values. So here we go. 
Um, basically, we want to know uh, what are the x-intercepts and the vertical asymptotes. So let's begin by setting this function equal to zero. The x-intercepts are going to be found. How do we find the x-intercepts of a rational function? What do we do? Speak into the microphone. Your, your hand signals are making no sense. Multiply. Multiply what? How do you find the x-intercepts of a rational function? You, you solve for x? Or I'm going to let you th discuss this amongst yourselves. How do you solve... For how do you find the x-intercepts of a rational function? Take a look at your notes for assignment 16. How do you find the x-intercepts? Maybe I should ask this question. How do you find the vertical asymptotes? All right, y'all, y'all, y'all have done assignment 16. Y'all told me that y'all submitted assignment 16. Assignment 16 was all about graphing rational functions. You had a numerator and you had a denominator. When you were graphing rational functions, you had to find x-intercepts and you had to find vertical asymptotes. So what were we doing with the numerator and the denominator? We worked with them separately. What were we doing with each numerator and each denominator? What were we doing? What were we doing? I'm, I'm going to let y'all think about this. What were we doing to the numerator to find the x-intercepts?
It says to find the x-intercepts if there are any by solving the equation px equals zero. Yeah, so what is p of x? x minus one. Yeah, it's the numerator. All right, so um, sounds to me like um, we had a brain lapse between assignment 16 and today. Yeah, to solve, if you have a rational function, where does that graph cross the x-axis? You set the numerator equal to zero, and you solve. So, going back over here to our problem, if I set p of x equal to zero, so we have x minus one equals zero, what is the x-intercept? One. going to circle that. All right, now how do I find the vertical asymptote? Or asymptotes, how do you find those? Q of x equals zero. Q of x equals zero. Which, in this problem, is going to be the x minus two equals zero. And what do you get when you set x minus 2 equal to 0? Good. So now we're going to take this information and we're going to put it on a number line. I meant to circle the And I'm going to indicate that the 2 is my vertical asymptote, just so I don't forget it. Now, we want to know when is this function less than 0. Another way to say less than 0 is when is this function negative. So we're going to pick some values in our intervals that we have here to see when the function is less than 0. So um, I like to pick easy things like zero. Zero is going to be in this interval from one to the left. So f at zero, you're going to have a uh, zero minus one, so you have a negative one over a negative two, which is all I really care about is if it's positive or negative. That's positive. So I'm going to put a little plus sign right up here. Then what about between 1 and 2? So let's do f at uh, 1.5. So um, let's see, 1.5 minus 1, that's going to be a positive 0 0.5. Then 1.5 minus 2 is going to be a negative 0 0.5 which is a negative value. So that's going to be negative. And then F at, what's something greater than 2 that's easy to plug in? I like 10. 10's easy. Uh, you have 10 minus 1, which is 9. 10 minus 2 is Eight, that's going to be positive. So the question is, going back up here to the original question, when is it less than zero? When is it negative? It's negative in between one and two. So there's the graph on a number line. To express this answer in interval notation, One, two, since it's strictly less than, it's dot or equal to, we can't circle, make these circles solid. We're just going to use open set parentheses and we're done. Now, again, we could graph this function 
we could have graphed this function to see what this does. Um, here's the graph of the function. Um, we found an x-intercept at 1, and we found a vertical asymptote at 2. Now, because the degrees of the numerator and denominator are the same, y equal to a over b is going to be my horizontal asymptote. Well, a is the leading coefficient of the numerator, that's 1. b is the leading coefficient of your denominator, that's also 1. So y equal to 1 is our horizontal asymptote. So back here down here at my graph, here is a horizontal asymptote at 1. So what is this graph doing? Well, we did some testing over here. The graph is positive for everything that's less than 1. In fact, the graph is going to behave something like this. Uh, excuse me. Um, sorry, that's not true. And the graph is going to behave something like this. That's not. It's going to behave like this. Where it's going to converge to the horizontal asymptote after 1. And then at 1, it's going to cross the x axis and it's going to start going down. Then after 1, because we don't have any other x-intercepts, the graph is going to have to do this. And it's positive right there. So when is the graph less than 0? The graph is less than 0 between 1 and 2. That's when the graph is less than 0. That's going to be this shaded region right there. All right, so... All right, so does that make sense? All right, now. What else can we look at? Can we go over 13? Yes. Problem number 13. We have 2x plus 1 over an x minus 3 is less than or equal to 3. All right. I don't know. I thought I would like this set up, but I don't. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to this. 2x minus 1 over an x minus 3 is less than or equal to 3. Now, 
they could graph this function. We could graph this function right here and see when this function is less than or equal to 3, but we don't want to do that. We can do that for uh, verification purposes, but we want to solve this problem without graphing. So what we need to do is we need to set this to be less than or equal to 0 because anytime that we go through the process of solving any almost any equation, we need to be we need it to be set equal to zero. So the way that we're going to do that is we're just going to subtract the three on both sides. Now, at this point, can I put these two terms together? Can I put this term and this term together? Why not? Because it's not... Because it's not in the fraction form, and they're not really the same. Why aren't they the same? Because the x minus 3 is the denominator, and the minus 3 is the whole number by itself. There you go. You got a fractional term, and you got a constant. So we need to combine these together. We need to recognize our LCD is x minus 3. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that negative 3 and we're going to multiply it by x minus 3 over an x minus 3. So then we get 2x minus 1 over an x minus 3 plus, now I'm going to distribute the negative with the 3, so negative 3 times x is a negative 3x. Negative 3 times a negative 3 is a positive 9 over an x minus 3. Now, can I put these two terms together? Why? Because they had the same denominator, right? So when I put these two terms together, we have 2x minus 1 minus 3x plus 9 over x minus 3 is less than or equal to 0. Can I combine any like terms together? Yeah, the 2x and the negative 3x makes a negative 1x, or negative x. The negative 1 and the positive 9 makes a positive 8 over an x minus 3. Hold on. That's an x plus 1. That's a 2x plus 1. I knew something was wrong because I just did this problem a while ago. 2x plus 1, so 1 plus 9 makes a positive 10. All right, there we go. That's better. Is less than or equal to 0. So like the last problem, the last problem we needed to know what were the x-intercepts and the vertical asymptotes? Same thing here. We need to find the x-intercepts and the vertical asymptotes. So, again, how do you find the x-intercepts? P of x equals zero. And what is P of x? Negative x plus 10. Good. Good. Negative x plus 10 is equal to 0. Now, it sounds to me like we're just not, it's just not clicking. Why, are this the, why is this the x-intercept? Because when you have a rational function, something over something, the only time that this is equal to 0 is when the top is equal to 0. Zero over anything is always going to be zero. We want to know when the top is zero. That's going to be what, if we don't care about what the bottom is, if the top is zero, then the function is equal to zero. So you get negative x 
is equal to negative 10, which means that x is equal to a positive 10. How do you find the vertical asymptotes? Q of x equals zero. And what is Q of x? X minus three. It's the bottom. If the bottom is equal to zero, then anything over zero is undefined, and that's what the vertical asymptote represents. It represents when the function is undefined. So we have x minus three is equal to zero, which means that x is equal to positive three. So now we're going to put this information on a number line. Three, ten. I'm going to remind myself that this is my vertical asymptote. Now, we're going to be looking at this function right here. Negative x plus ten over at x minus three. We want to know when it is less than or equal to zero. So here we go. Let's pick some value that's to the left of three. My favorite one would be zero. Because zero is really easy to plug in. So you have zero plus ten over a zero minus three. That's going to be negative. negative. I went ahead and shaded that. I don't know why because we're dealing with less than zero. If I do something between 3 and 10 like 5, f at 5, negative 5 plus 10 is a 5, sorry, 5, and then 5 minus 3 is 2, that's going to be positive. Well, I don't want to know when it's positive. I want to know when it's less than zero. So that's why I shaded over here. Then what's greater than 10? Um, the easiest thing I can think of is 100. I mean, there's lots of things that are greater than 10, but 100 is easy. So you have negative 100 plus 10. So that's going to be a negative 90. Over 100 minus 3, that's going to be... Um, a positive 97, that's going to be negative. So we're going to shade this way. Now, it's or equal to zero. Now we can make that x intercept a solid circle because at the x intercept, the graph is crossing the x axis, it's touching the x axis, so we can include that. But we cannot make this a solid circle around the three. Why? Because it's a vertical asymptote. We do not, the vertical asymptote, remember, is your boundary between, uh, is that vertical boundary that the graph cannot cross. So here's your graph on the number line. And how do we put this in interval notation? In interval notation, that's going to be from negative infinity to 3. Parenthesis around the 3, union with 10 to positive infinity, parenthesis around the infinity, bracket around 10, done. So, I want to take a moment now that my iPad is fully updated. Um, let's take a look at this function. So the original function the original function that we had was this uh, 2x plus 1 over x minus 3. So 2x plus 1 over the x minus 3. All right, so you can see what this graph is doing. 
there's going to be a vertical asymptote at 3, so that's going to be x equal to 3. Um, I'm going to do a quick setting on that. Let's make this blue. Let's make this red and dotted. Dash, there we go. So there's your vertical asymptote at 3. Now, this is for the original function. Now, what we want to do is we want to know, going back to the original question, when is this graph less than or equal to 3? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot y equal to 3. So here's the line, y equal to 3. When is this graph less than 3? Well, if you start zooming out and you zoom all the way back over here, you can see how big I'm going. Negative 9,000, take a look. That blue line represents the function. The green line is 3. Is the function less than 3? Yes. And if you pick a point on here, you can see those y values are getting... Uh, I mean, that y value is 1.999, but farther and farther you get out here, the closer and closer that y value gets to 3. Anyways, let's go back to the middle of the graph. When is this function less than 3? It's less than 3. Starting way back here at negative infinity all the way until you get to x equal to 3. At x equal to 3, as you get closer to 3, the graph is going down. It's still less than 3. But as soon as you get past 3, the graph is positive. It's up here. So from negative infinity to 3, the graph is below 3. Now after 3, it's positive. It's above 3. I should say that it's above 3. Now, how long does it get stay above 3? It stays above 3 all the way until you get to this point right here. At 10, the graph equals 3. But as soon as you get past 3, or as soon as, as you get past 10, the graph dips below 3. The graph is dipping below 3. And so it's now less than 3. So from 10 to infinity, including 10, the graph is less than or equal to 3. So that's the graphical interpretation of this problem. But we answered this question without looking at the graph of the function. And that's what we want to do. All right. So we only have two minutes left. So we're going to call that done for today. Um, anything else I want to say? Nothing else I want to say. Um, so uh, on Friday... Your we conference is scheduled to end quiz. in two minutes. Thank you for letting us know. That quiz will be over assignment 16 and 17. So graphing rational functions and then what we're doing today. So make sure you're prepared for that quiz and we will spend time uh, at the beginning of class answering questions over assignment 18 um, where assignment 18 we begin our introduction into logarithms. Um, so that this is probably one of my one of my favorite sections of college algebra dealing with logarithms. Um, anyways, hope y'all uh, make it get watch the lecture videos and we'll address questions over that section on Friday. So take care. See y'all later.
Your conference is now over. Goodbye.